Well, let's open our Bibles. Our text is going to be Acts 9, but I want you to turn to Mark chapter 3 to start this study this morning. Mark chapter 3, and I want to talk about the family of Christ. This season of the year, we think about families during Thanksgiving, during the Christmas season especially. Families have a time to get together. And there's some preliminary remarks. These first few points just have to do with preliminary thoughts. And then I just want you to see how the uh, family of Christ, the tremendous impact they made in the life of Saul of Tarsus, who became the Apostle Paul, and why all of us desperately need close association with believers. Well, first of all, just note that there are families of the earth, and then there's the spiritual family. And when you think about our families in the earth, uh, some would think, well, it's just maybe my biological family, but not necessarily so, because uh, we have people who adopt children, and uh, they love them just as much as if they had the children themselves, and they're part of their family. And then others would use this term family to think about uh, people in the workplace, and they're very close-knit there, and they can say, this is my family. Or if it's a school, they go to school and they'll say, it's my family here. I remember years ago, a young man who was playing football for the University of Oklahoma, he was a freshman and his mother died. And I'd met his mother and she had come to faith in Christ. And this boy was a star player out at Carl Albert and then he became a star player for the Sinners. And the whole Oklahoma football team came that day with their coaches. Coach Stoops was here. He and his wife, they sat with the family and the other coaches and the football team sat over here. But the Carl Albert people were here, and I, I made a comment that day. I said, well, the Carl Albert family's here. The Oklahoma Sooner family is here. And then his, her family, her children, they were here. So people can use family in those different kinds of ways. But uh, then there is the spiritual family. Now, there are many ways that we can use the term family when we think about lives in the earth. But when you think about a spiritual family, whether it's in this world or in eternity, there's only one spiritual family. And those are individuals who are followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. But your earthly family is your spiritual family. Well, look, Jesus, in these verses in, in Mark chapter 3, this is brought out, this distinction. In fact, this story is not only recorded in Mark chapter 3, it's recorded in Matthew chapter 12 and Luke chapter 8 also. All the synoptic gospels, they have this story. And look what it says, Mark chapter 3 in verse 31. It says, Then his mother and his brothers arrived standing outside. They sent word to him and called him. And a crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Behold, your mother and your brothers are outside looking for you. So here's Mary, and here's the other children she had. Now look, there's, uh, there's a group that will say Mary, after she gave birth to the Lord Jesus, continued to be a virgin. She never had any other children, and these that are referred to here are his cousins. Well, that's just not true. Mary and Joseph, they were married after Jesus was born. They consummated the act of marriage. They had other children. In fact, two of his brothers are contributors to the New Testament, James and Jude. And so here they are, and it's stated, uh, Jesus, your mother, Mary's out here, your brothers are out here. But then Jesus says this, verse 33, well, now, who, who are my mother and my brothers? And then looking about at those who were sitting around him, he said, behold, my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and my sister and my mother. And what is Christ talking about there? I'm sure they were confused when they first heard that, but he's talking about a spiritual family. Whoever does the will of God, then they are my mother, my brother, my sister, but my spiritual family. So his earthly family is there, but then his, he speaks of a spiritual family. Well, now notice only Christ followers have both families. Everybody in the world has some kind of earthly family, but only Christ followers have an earthly family and a spiritual family. Now, I know there are all sorts of uh, religions, and people are into different kinds of spirituality, so they say, and they say we have our, our spiritual group. Look, there is one spiritual family. It's called the body of Christ, and uh, that's the only one that exists, just one spiritual family. And the people who accept Christ are a part of that family. And you think of all these families, both are important. 
but uh, never discount the importance of this spiritual family. And it, we're brought into this family when we accept Christ. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and verse 13, it talks about how we're baptized by the Holy Spirit into one body. But we're baptized, no matter whether you're Jew, whether you're Greek, whether you're male, whether you're female, it just does not matter. But you are baptized into this body spiritually when you accept Christ. But there is that one body. Well, please, please note this. Your spiritual family is your eternal family. Now, that's not to say that your earthly families can't be. But you know as well as I do, it is entirely possible for people in an earthly family. It might be a husband, might be a wife, might be children. Where some in the family accept Jesus and some do not accept Jesus. And if that is true, then... That family is not an eternal family. You're not going to be together forever in eternity. And you say, well, that's a very dismal thought. Uh, well, it's true. It's true. If a wife's accepted Jesus and a husband is not, and they live the whole of their life like that, they will not see each other in eternity. Or if it's the husband that's accepted Christ, or the wife hasn't, or children haven't, or maybe parents haven't, but children have. And that's just a reality of life. Your eternal family is your spiritual family. Your brothers and sisters in Christ, you're going to spend eternity with them. They're the eternal family. And then there's this. People have to be informed that they're a part of a family. I think that's important for us to, to make note of that. They have to be informed. And you can conclude, well, everybody knows that they're a part of a family. Well, a little baby, when the little baby is born, does not know that it's a part of the family. Our family has been blessed here on November the 3rd. Caitlin Page Rutherford came into this world, and John and Brittany had their third little girl. And uh, Linda and I have been out there. Matt and Rhonda, Brenda, Brittany's parents have been there. We've all hugged on her, kissed her, held her, told her we've loved her, prayed for her, some have changed her. I mean, I have not done that as of yet, trying to avoid that. I did enough when our, my kids were growing up. But we've done everything, but Caitlin does not know right now she's part of the Rutherford Haas family. She does not know that. Now, as time goes by, she's going to understand that. But she, just like any other little baby, has to be informed. When I look, we need to understand the same thing's true of a person when they accept Christ. They're a spiritual babe in Christ. Don't make the assumption. I'll tell you, too many believers, we assume things that we shouldn't be assuming. And we think, well, if a person accepts Christ, they just know all this. No, they don't. They don't know they're a part of God's family, that they're in the body of Christ. They don't even know that's happened to them unless someone explains that. We've already studied about the Ethiopian eunuch, and when Philip went up to him and he heard him reading from Isaiah, he asked him, do you understand what you're reading? And the man had already been to worship. He'd heard that message of, in that time of worship, and the man said to him, a very gifted man, he said, how can I unless someone explains this to me? Well, certainly a lost person needs to have things explained to them, but don't think, well, as soon as they cross over and they become a believer, well, all of a sudden they just understand it all. They don't understand anything. You've got to explain that to them. And I don't care how gifted, how smart, how, how intelligent, how popular they are. They have to have it explained. They do not realize this. And they need to be informed. Look, now that you've accepted Jesus, you've got a whole lot of brothers and sisters. All over the world, people who have trusted in Christ are your brother and sister in Christ. But they have to have it told to them. They have to be educated on that. But then let's think about this. Let's just think about the important role that brothers and sisters in Christ play in our lives. And we see this unfold in Acts 9. But as you're making your way over there, stop off at John chapter 11. I want you to see this passage. This is a famous passage of Scripture. Lazarus was dead. Jesus comes and brings him forth from the grave. But there's an episode. Something happened after Jesus did that. Look in verse 41 of John chapter 11. 
Jesus offers a prayer to his father before he raised Lazarus, and he says, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but because of the people standing around here, I said it so that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And the man who had died came forth. But look at him. Look how he is. He's alive. But it says he is bound hand and foot with wrappings. And his face was wrapped around with a cloth. These are the grave clothes on him. And what did Jesus do? He said to those who were standing there, You unbind him and let him go. But you unbind him. You have to take these grave clothes off. Now, Jesus could have just said the word and they would have fallen off, but he didn't do that. He said to the people, you unbind this man and let him go. Well, when a person comes to Christ, Jesus comes into their life. He's forgiven them. He's cleansed them. The Holy Spirit of God lives in them. That's how Christ invades their lives. And yet still, I want to say that they have spiritual grave clothes on. They've been resurrected spiritually. They've been born again. That which is dead, their spirit, has now come to life in God, but they still have grave clothes on. You say, well, what are those grave clothes? Spiritual grave clothes. You can't see them. But it's things like this. Lack of understanding. That's one. Guilt over sins they've committed. Shame. These are grave clothes that can really bind them. And just, just like Jesus said to those on this occasion when he raised Lazarus from the grave, he said, you need to unbind him and let him go. He would say to believers, and this is how he'll use believers, he'll use followers to help those who've just come to Christ be released from some of these grave clothes, some of the guilt, some of the shame. Remember the Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, this man who had, had been in sin, terrible moral sin, and they had withdrawn fellowship from him, but apparently the man had repented. And now Paul writes to him and he says, you take him back, receive him back, lest he be overwhelmed with excessive sorrow. I mean, he can just be bound up. And you've got to relieve him of that. And you've got to release him and help him break free from some of these shackles of shame and guilt and embarrassment that are upon his life and even confusion within his life. Well, when you look in Paul's life, come on now to Acts chapter 9, you're going to see believers in the work that they're doing in his life. Let's think about Saul's encounter here with Jesus and the believers. Acts chapter 9, verses 3 and following, here's Saul of Tarsus. These verses talk about his conversion. He's breathing out threats, hatreds in his heart. Uh, oh, deep, deep-seated hatred is in his heart. And he's already, he's persecuted believers, he's killed some believers, he's had others in prison, and feels no remorse over this, and he's going along on his way to Damascus to do the same thing to believers there, and Jesus Christ stops him in his tracks. A blinding light comes, Saul cannot see, but he hears this voice that says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul says, well, who are you, Lord? And he said, I'm Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But you get up and enter the city, and it will be told to you what you must do. The men who were st standing with him, they heard the voice. They couldn't see anyone. They couldn't understand. They just heard the voice. And Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. I mean, this would be a, a strange. Here, his eyes wide open, but he cannot see a thing. And leading him by the hand, they brought him into Damascus, this man that was so powerful and uh, so aggressive now he's helpless and they're having to lead him help him into the city and it says in verse 9 three days and three nights uh, this man neither ate nor drank and he did not have his sight now can you imagine when that first happened here he meets Jesus so that had to be astounding but then he's blind and I know that we're going to read that the Lord gives him another vision here to let him see that his sight's going to come back. But I don't know that that vision came immediately. So when he's being led into the city and he's helpless 
and he can't see the man who'd had this privilege all his life. Can't you imagine some thoughts going through his mind? Maybe the Lord's going to keep me blind the rest of my life because of the torment that I've inflicted upon believers. I mean, who knows what was going on in his mind? Now, the Lord remedies that because he's going to give him a vision and say, a man's fixing to come to you, and he's going to help you. But uh, look what it says. Look how the Lord relieves his blindness. Uh, the Lord could have just said the word. He could have received his sight, but that's not how that happened. It says, look in verse 10. It says, there was a disciple, a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, well, here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, I want you to get up. I want you to go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus named Saul because he's praying and he has seen in a vision. I've communicated with him that a man named Ananias is going to come in and lay his hands on him so that he may regain his sight. And Ananias at first is very apprehensive and he says, oh, Lord, now let's just think about this for a moment. Because he said, I've heard many things about this man, how much harm he did to the saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from chief priests to bind all who call upon your name. But the Lord said, well, Ananias, you go ahead and go because he's a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. And I will show him how much he's going to have to suffer for my name's sake. And so Ananias, a faithful servant of Jesus, he departed. He entered the house, and after he laid his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. It doesn't say receive the Holy Spirit. That's already occurred. It says he be filled with the Spirit, that the Spirit of God may control your life. And immediately it says, there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he regained his sight, and he got up, and immediately he was baptized. And uh, the Lord's doing something very special in his life. But look what happened. Immediately, right after his conversion, the Lord Jesus gets him in touch with another believer. He didn't leave Saul out there and say, I'll just deal with Saul. He doesn't have to have other believers around him. I'll just deal with him myself. No, the first thing the Lord does is send a disciple to him to minister to him. That was Saul's first positive encounter with another follower of Christ. And for the rest of his life, his life is going to be closely united with believers. Wherever he went, believers would be with him or believers would be praying for him. They'd be supporting him. They'd be assisting him, but he had believers around him. You need to know this about Saul of Tarsus because what's true of him is true of all of us. Saul's life would not have been what it was without the help of believers. It would not. The Apostle Paul would not have had the victories that he experienced over sin in his own life. His ministry would not have been as powerful as it was were it not for the guidance and the prayers and the love and the support of believers around him. And you can look in Acts 9 and see that that is absolutely true because Acts 9 lets us see, were it not for believers, Saul of Tarsus wouldn't even have lived very long after he came to Christ. Look at some of these verses. Look in verse 23. <clears throat> it says after he was baptized, in fact, look in verse 20. It says he was with the disciples for several days at Damascus, and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying he is the Son of God. How ironic is that? The persecutor is now the preacher. And all those hearing him continued to be amazed, and they said, Is this not he who in Jerusalem destroyed those who called on this name and who has come here for the purpose of bringing them bound before the chief priests? But Saul kept on increasing in strength and confounding the Jews who lived at Damascus by proving that this Jesus is the Christ. And you'd think people would just be ecstatic. All people would be at the great change. A murderer has been relieved from that spirit of hate. But look what it says in verse 23. When many days had elapsed, the Jews plotted together to do away with him. They planned an assassination. We've got to kill this guy. 
We want to get rid of him. Now, how is Saul of Tarsus going to get out of this? Well, it says in verse 24, Their plot became known to Saul, and they were also watching the gates day and night so that they might put him to death. But who rescued him? Who protected his life? It says his disciples took him by night and led him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a large basket. And then if you look down in verse 29, look what it says. He has now come to Jerusalem. And when he's in Jerusalem, it says in verse 29 that he was talking and arguing with Hellenistic Jews. But look at their reaction to him. They were attempting to put him to death. Here's a second assassination attempt. They wanted this man removed from the earth. Now, who's going to save his life? Who's going to rescue him? It says in verse 30. When the brethren learned of it, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him away to Tarsus. But it was brothers in Christ who protected his life. And then when he first came to Jerusalem, this is interesting to me, in verse 26, because word certainly spread. He comes to Jerusalem. Now he's trying to associate with the disciples, but they're all afraid of him. They don't want to have a thing to do with him. These are the believers in Christ. Well, this is Saul of Tarsus. This is a man who approved of Stephen's death and who's been so harsh on believers, we can't believe he's saved. And so they pulled away from him because maybe they thought he's just a plant. He's just coming in to try and find out who the believers are. The, you know, in North Korea, they, they treat believers horribly. They'll execute them. They'll imprison them. But then North Koreans... Uh, some of their officials will see to it that they'll put some of their men into areas where Christians are as plants just to find out who these people are so that they can go and bring great damage to their lives. And so maybe these in Jerusalem, maybe they thought to themselves, well, a Saul of Tarsus, he's just a plant. He's coming in trying to find out which one of us really are followers of Christ, and then he's going to, he's going to do harm to us. So they wouldn't have a thing to do with him. Now, how's Saul of Tarsus? How's he going to be accepted if these people were so afraid of him? And well, look what it says here in the verse 27. It says, Barnabas, one believer, Barnabas took hold of him. Barnabas brought him to the apostles. And Barnabas explained to the apostles how Saul of Tarsus had seen the Lord on the road to Damascus and how the Lord had talked to him and how at Damascus he had spoken out boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus. And once Barnabas did that, then the other believers accepted him. And it says he was with them, moving about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. But do you see the impact that believers had in the life of Saul of Tarsus' spiritual family? They protected him from death. Barnabas was used of God to get him to be accepted. Ananias is the one the Lord used to take him to that place so he could receive his sight. I mean, believers were around him immediately. And throughout all his life, throughout all his ministry, it was believers who were there to support him and help him and guide him and pray for him. Believers were used of the Lord mightily in the life of Saul of Tarsus. Well, look, I just want to say it again. What was true of Saul of Tarsus, that's true of us. Uh, there is no, no Christian who's uh, like, I, I'm an island. I don't need you. Or if you want to stand up and say, oh, yeah, well, I don't need any of y'all. I can just do it on my own. I just take care, of, take care of my life on my own. I can flourish spiritually, and I don't need any believer around. That's nonsense. Look what it says here in verse 31 of Acts chapter 9. It says, so the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoyed peace, being built up and going on in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, and it continued to increase. But just look at those terms there, peace. And this wasn't just talking about temporarily some relief from persecution. It's talking about the internal quality of peace, the peace of God in a person's life, and peaceful relations with other beliefs, these qualities. And then it says they were built up in their faith, being built up in their faith, their commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ strengthened as a believer when they faced the onslaughts of Satan 
and the enemies of Christ, their association with other believers gave them strength and encourage, encouraged them in their walk. And then look what it says, their fear and reverence of the Lord. That was growing. Now, we just sang in that uh, little monthly chorus that we had the words about adoring him. And there's a chorus at Christmas, I think, we sing, come let us adore him. And that's his sense of reverence and worship. And it says they're growing in that regard, in respect. And then it says this, that in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were comforted. And the Spirit of God, he is the comforter, and he's the one that comforts our lives. But the Spirit of God doesn't just use his presence in our lives. He'll use believers around us, things they say to us, prayers they offer for us to bring a measure of comfort to us. And Paul, he knew that. Look what it says. Hold your place there a moment. Look over Romans chapter 1. Just a few pages over. Look what he says right in the beginning of the book of Romans. Romans chapter 1 in verse 8. Paul writes these believers and he says, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is being proclaimed throughout the whole world. He said, I'm hearing about your faith and your walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said, that's inspiring me. That's lifting me up. And then he says, For God whom I serve in my spirit in the preaching of the gospel of his son is my witness as to how unceasingly I make mention of you. How I pray for you. When I speak to others, I talk about you because your life is of encouragement to them. But he says, in my prayers, I'm always in my prayers making requests. If perhaps now at last by the will of God I may succeed in coming to you. Paul longed to be around these believers. He said, I long, I deeply desire to see you so that I may impart some spiritual gift to you. Paul's saying, I have things that I can offer to you that will help you in your life. But now look at this. I want to offer this to you so that you may be established more in your faith. But look in verse 12. He says, it's not just for you, it's for me. He said, I want to be with you that I may be encouraged together with you while among you. Each of us by the other's faith, both yours and mine. But he's saying, I need you as much as you need me. He said, I can offer things to you that will help you be established, and you can offer things to me that will help me in my faith, in my walk with the Lord Jesus, and I long to get to be with you. But all these things that it says in Acts chapter 9 and verse 31, and then it goes on and even says this, the body of Christ, it continued to increase. And that didn't just mean that the believers got stronger, but it means because of their life, because of their relationship that they had with each other and with the Lord, because of the witness that they declared about the Lord Jesus Christ, people who didn't know the Lord came to know him as Savior. But all those wonderful things were happening, this, this tremendous encouragement that was taking place. Well, listen, here's God's word for us. It is God's plan and God's purpose that as his followers, we be closely linked with brothers and sisters in Christ. Listen, I'll just say this to you. If, if you're not, you're outside the will of God for your life. And there's some people that get to a place where they think, well, look, I've, I've done enough church in my life and I, really, I want to take Sundays off, and I just want to relax on Sunday or do my thing. And I don't, I don't need all that. It's a grave mistake. Grave mistake. If, if Saul of Tarsus, who became Paul, the greatest missionary, greatest preacher, greatest theologian, greatest church builder the world's ever seen, if he needed the association of other believers, you and I desperately do. All believers need this. It is God's plan. It's God's purpose for us. This is how he... He builds us. This is how he strengthens us. And then I would just say this, the other word, when I look in Acts 9, 31, you can just mark this down. All these things that you read of in verse 30, 31, where it talks about peace and the reverence of the Lord, having that strength in your life and being built up in your life and being comforted in your life, all those things, if you shun believers, you're not going to be experiencing that. 
You say, sure, I just, it's just Jesus in me. I had a guy years ago that I dealt with that just periodically he would attend church, but he had some major issues with intoxicating substances. And he was a successful businessman. Now, this wasn't some guy who was a pauper. This was a guy who was extremely successful, but he struggled with these substances. And I remember one evening, well, they found him up at John Conrad at the golf course one day sitting out in the parking lot, and the guy went out there, he thought he was dead. And they got him to the hospital. They called me, and when I went to the hospital at, at night, uh, his wife was there, and they had this whole, he was just self-medicated. I don't know how he got all these drugs, but he got them. He was taking all this, and uh, well, they had him in there for a while, and I talked to him, and here's what he kept saying to me. And he said it on different occasions. He said, uh, Jesus and me, we'll handle this. Just G Jesus and me. We'll take care of it. And he's like, I, I don't need anyone else. And that was just wasn't the case for him, and it's not the case for you. All these things that he speaks of. That's not going to occur in your life unless you have close association. Listen, I'm not saying you can't have people who are friends of yours that are not followers of Christ, but I'm just saying this, they better not be your best friends. Your best friends need to be those who walk with the Lord Jesus and help you in your life because they're the ones who encourage you. And they're the ones that can help you be strong in your faith. You know, we had a deal over uh, Thanksgiving. Out in our backyard, we'd had some trees planted a few years ago, and a couple of them, one we just lost, and so uh, the wind blew it over. But these other trees were gorgeous, and this year, we had one tree that was red, and it was tall, and on Thanksgiving Day, I told Linda, I said, that's as pretty as I've ever seen this tree. It's gorgeous, beautifully shaped. And then the ice comes in. And the, the day after that, I got up and looked out the window, and that beautiful, gorgeous tree was just shattered. And I got to tell you, that affected me in a bad way. And I, it just kind of made me sad. It was so gorgeous. And now it's just a mess. But this morning, when I got up, I looked out there, and it's like one branch of the tree bounced back, and it kind of lifted my spirits. <laughs> the thing's fighting back. <laughs> well, let me tell you, in the Christian life, you're going to go through things where you, life can be beautiful for you, but then the ice storm can come in and just devastate your life. But when you get around some other believers and you can look at them and say, wow, look what they've gone through. But they've bounced back. That can be such encouragement. It gives hope to you. If you don't have that in your life, you can sink into deep sadness and depression. There's a little lady years ago, I passed her a long time ago in Texas, and her name was Claudia Brewer. And Claudia, just a little lady, real thin. She taught Sunday school class at, at Temple at our church. And uh, Claudia, when I learned about her life, her son was killed in Vietnam. And then as time went by, her husband had a stroke. And she had to take care of him. She had him at home and took care of him. And then her mother, as more time went by, years went by, her mother, she had major problems physically. And Claudia cared for her as best she could, finally had to put her in a, a nursing home. And to me, I'd look at her and I'd think, my word, this lady should just be ready to give up. I mean, she's lost her son. She's had to care for her husband for years. She cared for her mother. Now her mother's in this terrible shape. And this little short lady that seemed so weak physically was a giant spiritually. She kept teaching her Sunday school class, kept serving the Lord, kept ministering to people. 
Now, I'm telling you, not just for me, but for others who saw her. If we went through tough times, but we just see her, her life. It was like that part of the tree that came back, and it just inspired you. It gave you hope. It gave you encouragement. That's what believers can do. That's what they did for the Apostle Paul. That's what they can do for you. And that's why the writer of Hebrews, he's very realistic in what he's saying here, but he's challenging the believers. In Hebrews 10, 25, he said, listen, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as a habit of some is. He said, I know, some just drop by the wayside. But he said, don't you make that mistake. Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Instead, you be together so that you can encourage one another all the more as you see the day. The day of Christ's return as you see that approaching. So listen, you've got your families here in this world. You've got your earthly families, but you've got your spiritual family. And never make the mistake of underestimating the importance of your spiritual family. They're the ones that Jesus will use to bless you, to help you, to inspire you, to strengthen you. Without them, you and I, we're not going to resist temptation. We're not going to overcome troubles. Uh, we're not going to be very peaceful in life. But with them, we can live a life that's victorious. Let's bow for prayer. Father, I just thank you that you do make us into a body of Christ. And Lord Jesus, we are brothers and sisters. There could be some people sitting in here this morning that, uh, Father, maybe, maybe all their loved ones are gone. And they think, I'm all alone, I don't have a family. And Lord, help them to know that is just not true. That, uh, Lord Jesus, they've got a spiritual family, and that's their eternal family. But Lord Jesus, I just uh, pray for us. Help us to see, as believers, the importance that we play in each other's lives. And Lord Jesus, help us to do what the writer of Hebrews wrote about. Help us not to get to a place where we just become nonchalant about our our Christian family and think we don't need that. Lord, help us to know how much we need each other. And Father, I pray every person in here can know that their life is needed. All of us need them. And Lord, I just uh, would ask you also for people who might be here today that have never received you as their Savior. I pray, Lord Jesus, help them to know that you'd gladly receive them and forgive them if they'll just come to you and trust you. And Lord, we ask this in your name. And while our heads are still bowed and our eyes are closed, we'll be dismissed in just a moment. But it's a great opportunity. If you've never trusted in Christ, right now you can make that decision. And when the service is over, I hope if you'd like to make that commitment, that you just come down here to the front. And we'd be glad to talk with you and, and help you in making this discovery of Jesus Christ. Any other commitments you'd need. If you need somebody to pray for you, maybe you're a believer and you're going through hard times and you've tried to keep it all to yourself and you think, I, I don't want to do that anymore. I just need somebody to pray for me. I hope you'd come and express that. And there'll be people down here that can pray for you and pray with you. Or it might be you're a believer and you're looking for a church home. You feel like this is where you'd like to be. And if that's true, we hope that you'd come and express that. And we'll be thrilled to have you be a part of Meadowood.